Hello everyone and welcome to The Quarter. I'm your host, Daniel Boyd. Sports is one of the singular events that can unite millions to root for a team, a person, or a nation. And I'm Union Martinez. In this episode of The Quarter, we'll examine the influence of athletes on American culture and society. Having the identity of a professional athlete brings glory, influence, and the power to shape society. We'll explore how an athletic identity can change our minds, our hearts, and our world. Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, Serena Williams, Babe Ruth, all well-known names here in the States, some more recent than others. The world of sports shapes what we watch as entertainment, and it creates some of the most memorable figures of our time. Sports bring people together, to all to cheer and to make connections. The Olympics brings nations together, and we support our nation's athletes. We're Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier at Madison Square Garden, one of the great fights in boxing. Like no other event, sports has the power to unite people of different races, backgrounds, and cultures. And it has the power to shape the way our culture comes together in times of joy, in times of grief, and in times of social unrest. On April 15, 1947, Jackie Robinson crossed the color line in Major League Baseball and he changed race relations in America every time he entered the field, simply being present. Being the first black man in a previously all-white league on the field, Jackie knew he would face racist remarks and criticism, but he kept a mentality that couldn't be broken. He remained polite, kept his composure, and was never boastful. Jackie had a great first season. He won the International League batting title with a 349 average and led the Royals to the championship. After the final game, some fans affectionately chased Jackie in celebration through the streets of Montreal. It prompted Sal Malton of the Pittsburgh Courier to write, this marked perhaps the only time in history that a white mob chased a Negro, not because of hate, but because of love. Jackie changed the minds of Americans about color and opened the door for an integrated baseball league. While people of color have become more prominent in sports, women still struggle to be included and treated the same. Billie Jean King became the first woman to make history by taking down a male tennis champion. Audrey Lewis shows us how a king used her influence to change the tennis world for the better. It's impossible to talk about the history of women's sports without mentioning Billie Jean King. She's one of the world's greatest tennis players ever, winning 20 Wimbledon championships, 39 major titles, and being the first woman athlete of any kind to win $100,000 in prize money in a single year. But her contributions to the world far exceed her impressive tennis abilities. Billie Jean King is one of the most prominent advocates for equality of the last half a century in the world of sports and beyond. King won her first singles championship in 1966, defeating Brazil's Maria Bueno in the Wimbledon Ladies Singles Championship. She used this platform to argue for equal pay for male and female athletes. It did help that I was number one in the world, because if you're not number one, nobody listens. In 1970, upset with the state of women's tennis tournament, she joined a group of eight other female tennis stars to create the Virginia Slims Tour, a place for them to play that would guarantee fair prize money. Three years later, King convinced her colleagues to form the Women's Tennis Association and was appointed as its first president. King faced her fair share of naysayers, but none was more prominent than Bobby Riggs, a retired male tennis player who publicly boasted that the women's game was inferior to the men's and that he could easily beat the top women's tennis player. In 1973, he challenged a number of female tennis players to go head-to-head -head with him, offering hefty $100,000 prizes. On May 13th, Mother's Day, King's colleague Margaret Court took the bait and lost. When he then challenged Billie Jean King, she knew she couldn't let her fellow women down. On September 20th, 1973, King faced off with Bobby Riggs in the Houston Astrodome in a game dubbed by the media as the Battle of the Sexes. A record crowd of over 30,000 spectators attended, with at least 50 million more watching from home. Viewers across America watched as King dominated from the first point, going on to win the match 6-4, 6-3, 6-3. But King's story doesn't end there. She would go on to found Women's Sports Magazine and the Women's Sports Foundation. In 1981, she became the first prominent female athlete to publicly come out as gay. 
Her achievements were so powerful and so numerous that in 1990, Life magazine named her as one of the 100 most important Americans of the 20th century. She was one of only four athletes on the list, joined by Babe Ruth, Jackie Robinson, and Muhammad Ali. Billie Jean King's fight for equal rights in the 1970s paved the way, not just for women, but for all people to participate in sports and live their authentic lives today. Well, sports is so visible uh, that we can really help others in a much more uh, quick way than other types of endeavors because it's much more subjective. In sports, it's very objective. You either win or you lose, mm -hmm. and you're out there, and it's real. For The Quarter, I'm Audrey Lewis. Thank you, Audrey. The work Billie Jean King did opened the door for current players like Venus and Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka. When we come back, we'll look at the NFL and its impact on police brutality and equity in hiring. We'll be right back. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. If you could see you through my eyes instead of your ego, I believe you'd be surprised to see that you've been blind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Yeah, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse Walk a mile in my shoes While opportunity for black athletes are more widespread than before, thanks to Jackie Robinson, the battle for equity in coaching continues. I took a look at one NFL's coach's battle for equity. For the past decade, the NFL has been heavily criticized more than any other national league when it comes to its hiring of black coaches. As of right now, there is only one black NFL coach, that's Mike Tomlin of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Among other leagues, the NFL has 14 black coaches and the NHL has 9. Back in February, the former Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores filed a lawsuit against the NFL, the New York Giants, the Denver Broncos, and the Miami Dolphins organization, alleging racial discrimination. Flores came out with this lawsuit after finding out three days before his interview with the Giants that they already decided to hire Brian Dable. Flores says he learned this after receiving a text message from New England Patriots coach Bill Belichick congratulating him. He soon learned that Belichick sent him that text by mistake. Flores alleges in his lawsuit that the interview with the Giants was just so the team could show the league commissioner, Roger Goodell, and the public that it was in compliance with the Rooney Rule. The rule was first placed back in 2003 in an effort to increase diversity in the NFL teams. The rule mandates that every team must interview at least two external minority candidates for open coaching positions. Flores and his attorney spoke about the lawsuit on the morning talk show Get Up on ESPN, in which he states, it's time for change. I was upset that I wasn't getting a true opportunity um, to show what I can do, to show what I can bring to a team. Flores also put out a statement that day in which he says he knows he's potentially cost himself from coaching the game that he loves, but this situation is bigger than himself. Flores' attorneys also spoke on Get Up, given their statement. This is a knock on the fact that the job was promised before Coach Flores even got an opportunity. And there's backroom dealings and information that Coach Belichick knows why. Why is that being discussed? Why do people have this information? Why is a decorated coach like Coach Flores, you know, humiliated into having to sit through an interview and dinner when a decision's already been made? Flores now awaits a court date as the lawsuit was filed in the U.S. District Court in the Southern District of New York. With Flores speaking out and standing up for what he believes in, there's hope that with this new lawsuit, change will come for black coaches. Flores' courageous approach to giving the voices a voice is a true testament to his character. He may have been the final cue for black coaches to be given a fair and true opportunity. Even if Flores doesn't get another head coaching job, Flores will be leaving an incredible mark for black coaches and job interviews to be held to the same standards as they are for white coaches. And that's not just in football. That goes for multiple major industries. For the quarter, I'm Yunye Martinez. I sure hope it will, Yunye. But Brian Flores isn't the only NFL figure in recent memory to risk their job security to make a change outside the lines of the field. 
I dug into Colin Kaepernick's story and saw how he is using his platform as a force for change. Let's take a look. Back in 2014, there was only one answer to the question, who is Colin Kaepernick? Kaepernick was the 26-year-old quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, and only a year removed from a three-point loss in Super Bowl 47. Kaepernick was a dual-threat quarterback, able to move the ball down the field as both a passer and a rusher. To this day, he holds the record for most rushing yards by a quarterback in a single game. Kaepernick would go on to play in injury-shortened seasons in 2015 and 2016. After that, he opted out of his contract with the San Francisco 49ers. Since then, he's not been signed to an NFL team. In 2017, sports and politics website 538 wrote an article about Kaepernick's prolonged free agency. For quarterbacks of Kaepernick's quality, spending any significant amount of time unsigned was almost unheard of. Their conclusion, that Kaepernick was being frozen out for political opinions. Kaepernick was vocal in his critiques of the police-involved shootings of Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Charles Kinsey, and the acquittal of police in relation to the death of Freddie Gray. All four incidents took place during the summer of 2016. In the third preseason game of that year, Kaepernick's social commentary made its way to the limelight as he chose to sit during the playing of the national anthem. There are a lot of things that are going on that are unjust, people aren't being held accountable for, and that's something that needs to change. That's something that, you know, this country stands for freedom, liberty, justice for all. And it's not happening for all right now. Kaepernick's protest shifted from sitting to kneeling after a conversation with United States Army Green Beret and Seattle long snapper Nate Boyer, and players around the league followed suit. The popularity of the protest placed Kaepernick at the center of a national debate. The divide in opinion is best illustrated through the reactions of the two most recent U.S. presidents. On Twitter and during campaign rallies leading up to the 2016 presidential election, Donald Trump painted the protests as unpatriotic and disrespectful to members of the armed forces. I watched Colin Kaepernick and I thought it was terrible. And then it got bigger and bigger and started mushrooming. And frankly, the NFL should have suspended him for one game and he would have never done it again. President Barack Obama took a different view, citing Kaepernick's constitutional right to protest, along with the long history of athletes achieving social change via protest. So who is Colin Kaepernick today? The answer is less clear than it was nearly 10 years ago. He might be a formal NFL quarterback. Then again, he might not be. Kaepernick is steadfast in his goal of returning to the NFL, claiming to be in the best shape of his life just earlier this year. Depending on who you ask, he could be unpatriotic or trying to ruin the game of football. But former Cleveland Browns wide receiver Andrew Hawkins takes a far different view. And say, oh, he should be doing this, he should be doing that. But him raising the awareness, people having the conversation, you don't know who that's going to affect. You don't know what, you know, 12-year-old kid is watching Kaepernick and, and might start asking critical questions about it. He might grow up to be a judge. He might grow up to be a police officer. He might grow up to be anything that could help the situation. For most, that will be Kaepernick's legacy, regardless of whether he ever plays another snap of football or not. Rather, he is someone who stood up for what he believed in, no matter the consequences. For The Quarter, I'm Daniel Boyd. Kaepernick continues to advocate against racial discrimination and still has his eyes set on return to the league. Earlier this month, University of Michigan coach Jim Harbaugh invited Kaepernick to an open workout at a preseason game. As of right now, Kaepernick remains out of the NFL. Well, Dan, maybe, maybe we'll hear more about Kaepernick as the NFL season approaches. But for now, we have a break coming up after we discuss the current recent controversial figure in women's sports, Leah Thomas. Stay tuned. As a scientist, I know by the time she takes her first breath, nine billion more tons of carbon pollution will be in the air. When she takes her first steps, wildfires will have burned millions more acres she could have explored. By the time a child born today goes to college, it may be too late to leave them the world we promised. Our window to act on climate change is like watching them grow up. We blink and we miss it. We're all just trying to keep things running for those who rely on us. That's why we don't have time to be sick with the flu. We don't have time for delays. 
We don't have time for spells. Next. We don't have time for setbacks. Let's be real. Getting the flu shot helps you fight the flu. Get a flu shot for yourself and those around you too. Welcome back everyone to the quarter. So far we've looked at how athletes moved our society forward by breaking the color line in baseball and breaking down the doors for equal pay in tennis. But in the 21st century, there are more fights to be won. We turn to Luke McCarthy to have him take a look at the most recent controversial person in women's sports, Leah Thomas. Take a look. Leah Thomas is said to be one of the most controversial people in sports right now. Thomas is breaking new gender barriers within sports because she is the first openly trans woman to win an NCAA championship in the sport of swimming. In a recent interview with the Swim Swam podcast, Thomas talks about her transition to becoming a woman and how swimming fits into her own personal story. It's in swimming um, and basically being in a swimsuit 20 hours a week um, has sort of helped me um, with accepting my body as it is and being proud and comfortable in my body and in who I am. Leah's identity as a trans woman has sparked a heated debate in the sports world, which is a new direction in gender equity. Many say that her past identity as a male gives her an unfair advantage in the competitive ring that other swimmers simply do not have. And it is wrong. Um, and I'm very disappointed in the NCAA. They did kick the can down the road. And, uh, but we have to deal with this issue. We have to protect women's sports. They've worked so hard for equality. Look at Title IX. For years, they got that and finally got it through. I love women's sports. We have to protect it. Even on her own team, Thomas is not immune to criticism, with a parent of a teammate saying in a Sports Illustrated article, quote, We support Leah as a trans woman and hope she leads a happy and productive life because that's what she deserves, one parent of a Penn swimmer says. What we can't do is stand by while she rewrites records and eliminates biological women from this sport. If we don't speak up here, it's going to happen in college after college, and then women's sports as we know it will no longer exist in this country. Even in the face of all this criticism, Leah remains steadfast in her desire to swim. She says that she wants to inspire trans kids not to have to choose between who they are and the sport that they love. Reporting for The Quarter, I'm Luke McCarthy. Thank you, Luke, for that story. Now let's head to Yunye, who will introduce a slightly different story about a new kind of sport that's rapidly growing. That's right, Dan. While, while Leah Thomas is advocating for trans people within sports, Jake Davis takes a look at a community that anyone can join eSports. The world of eSports is an ever-evolving landscape, filled to the brim with high-level players from all over the world. Even with a low bar to entry, as anyone can compete with enough effort, the scene has a staggeringly few amount of women compared to men. Statistically, this makes little sense, as almost 47% of all people who play video games casually are women, compared to the much lower 22% in competitive esports. As for why, the answer may lie in a lack of accessibility due to preconceived notions. The scene being male-dominated prevents a lot of women from seeing it as a career path, creating a disparity. Esports is off to a great start. It's it's a it's a landscape where anyone can achieve great things through meritocracy. You just have to put forward good work. And I know a lot of people who are capable of good work and who are held back for other reasons. And part of those reasons is the people at the very top don't help them feel like they belong. According to researcher Natalie Dank, the lack of women in the associations is one of the leading causes of women being held back in esports. Despite some unfortunate circumstances, the scene is not hopeless as by breaking down stereotypes and allowing women to see this as an opportunity, it may be possible to change the landscape of esports. For The Quarter in Burlington, I'm Jake Davis. Thank you, Jake. Hopefully we will start to see that change in esports as more women join the scene. And with that, we're out of time for this episode of The Quarter. I'm Daniel Boyd. And I'm Yunye. Thank you for watching. We'll see you soon. Thank you.